Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. What's up? And thank you for watching Social Jello with Angelo. You want to help me out? Subscribe to my show on YouTube. And for you guys that want to do, help out some more, jump at jump on at socialjello.com, scroll down to the Amazon banner, click, and it's all set. <laughs> Hope you enjoy the show. You gotta represent. So I'm here with Chris. You yeah, Chris, you know, De Rose, De La Rose. D Rose. D Rose. See, I, I love one of the things I love to do in my show is butcher the guest's name right before we get started. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like it. Uh, I've I've had a life of people butchering that name. I've had De La Rosa, De La Rose, and I'm sometimes it was teachers in school, and I was like, "You're teaching me how to read, and you can't read my name." <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I get that. Like, you know, my last name being Ferrer. I'm sure the teacher had the same face. Like, she's saying all the last names. Smith, McDonald gets to your name and does like the shocked look. Like, oh. <laughs> right. Save that kid for last. I mean, at least it isn't like Norwegian. Yeah. At least it isn't Norwegian or Russian, though, right? <laughs> true. True. <laughs> so, Chris, um, for those listening, this is part of the Kajukembo series. Chris is. Not only a Kajikembo black belt, but he came straight from our from my school, our school, uh, under Professor Ronnie Sigiri. Uh, I always mention this in the beginning, and it tends to put some people off, but I will say it. I'm not a huge geek about rank, but I always do ask my guests to say their rank so that people that don't do martial arts can at least have an idea of what they're working with. So, uh... That being said, Chris, what 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 rank do you hold in Kajukembo? I am a first degree black belt. Cool, cool, first degree, and that means uh, as a first degree, you have your instructor certificate, and you can also teach, right? Yep. Yep. Well, I got my instructor certificate with my black belt, and then got the first degree a little later. Cool, cool, nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. So, how did that start? How did you get into Kajukembo? How did that happen? Well, um, my mom and I and my brother had just moved to Escondido and, um, you know, as a Caucasian male, I'm kind of a minority <laughs> and, uh, I got picked on a lot. <clears throat> so I also just, I don't know, I did a lot of sports and stuff all the time and I was always looking for new physical activities to do. And so, uh, when professor, uh, Ronnie came to the boys and girls club, uh, I don't know if you've had Mike Shaw on here, but Mike was still a white belt. Oh wow! All right. And I saw I saw him and Adrian, Johnny, and you know everyone doing uh, their line basics and doing everything. And um, I don't know, just it, it looked great. And I mean, you see, a, I don't know, I've seen a lot of martial arts demos in my life, especially you know us having put on martial arts demos. We see other demos, you know, and uh, you know Professor Rod. Professor Ronnie puts on a, a really good show and he teaches really well. So they really, really impressed me. Um, and so I was like, if his first student, one of the first students and Ronnie always tells him that I was the only guy in class. And I think I, pro I probably was, maybe there was one other boy, but it was me and a bunch of girls learning self-defense at the boys and girls club is where it started. Sweet. And how old were you when that started? I think I was like 10. Okay, cool. Cool. The Boys and Girls Club. And for those listening, uh, yeah, Mike Shaw is another black belt. I haven't interviewed him yet. He's been pretty busy. Um, but I do want to get around to that oh, okay. very soon. Yeah, yeah. You're actually... He was one of my greatest teachers, man. You, yeah, I, I think all, all of us. If you, <laughs> All of us. He, he kicked all our asses. <laughs> but in, in a good yeah, way. He was, he he was a great mentor for all of us. Oh, totally. Always in control. <laughs> so, yeah, Showing you your weaknesses. Yeah, I think in the lineup, you are the... Third. Third? I guess, yeah, third. I, I interviewed Professor Ronnie Sigiri. I interviewed uh, Francisco, uh, who recently got grandfathered in, and Bob. 
and now you're the f- so four. I've only interviewed four people from our okay. school. So yeah, you're the in the in the student lineup. You're okay. the third that's been able to have the time to come in and share your story. You started at ten years old, and you so you were saying Professor put on a great show, and he does. He's got a really great way of presenting Kaju Kembo in a in a in a show format. Um, you started learning self defense. How long? Did it take for you to figure out that this was something that you weren't just going to do for a few weeks? You know, you have a lot of white belts come in, try Kaju Kembo once and go, go through that first lesson of being yelled at and being told to be in a horse stance for 10 minutes. And a lot of people just walk out the door. What made you feel like, hey, this is something that I like. I, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going and I'm not going to I'm not going to let it go. I mean. I don't know. I've I've always kind of liked discipline and structure in a way. Um, and being in a an environment where, I don't know, you're not being put down, but you're being worked physically and emotionally and mentally in a way, you know, it, I don't know. I've, I've had other sports situations and situations like that. And I find that's a, a place where a lot, a lot of people thrive. You can really find out who you are in those kind of situations. And, um, I don't know. I took a liking to my professor and, um, we kind of became like family over time, you know, but I don't know. I, I don't think it was ever something I thought of whether or not I was going to keep doing this. You know what I mean? It was just, as soon as we started, I was just so immersed in it that I just, I wanted to do nothing but that. And I mean, at the boys and girls club, the classes were two days a week. And I quickly started going to the Hilltop class on Saturdays. And I think he was teaching somewhere else uh, then or within like six months of me starting. And so I started kind of just following him around to all the schools and doing it as many days a week as I could, which ended up being like five or six days a week. Um, But it wasn't never anything I really thought about. You know, my mom was willing to pay for it and I enjoyed it and I was getting flexible. You know, I'd, I'd always been a big guy that was some, that was pretty athletic, but I wasn't very flexible. And I saw what it was doing for my flexibility and I was really interested. And you mentioned you played other sports too. What other sports did you do? Uh, I grew up playing soccer, basketball, did some baseball. Baseball is just so boring. <laughs> <laughs> but I like soccer and basketball the most. Nice, nice. So you kept coming in. You said he was helping you with your flexibility, and, and uh, you were saying as a bigger guy. Um, I can attest to uh, Chris is a bigger guy, and he. one of the things that I noticed when I first walked in to train was how quickly, even though you were a big guy, how quick you would move. Um, even back then, yeah. as a kid, you, you were a big kid, but – just because you were big, you moved quickly. Like you didn't move. Like you've seen some of the big guys. Um, if you watch UFC, you've seen some big guys that are kind of slow and clunky, and they tend to gravitate more towards grappling because of it. And then there's some big yeah. guys like uh, Fury Tyson, right, in boxing, to give an example. They're mm-hmm. big, but just because they're big, this doesn't stop them from moving, having the footwork of someone who's smaller. They can have that, that really clean footwork, and they move fast. And that's something I saw in you. When I first walked in there way back in the day as a white belt. But um, from there, you trained. You got better at other sports. When on your journey, was there ever a time that you knew you were going to try to go for the black belt? Or was it something that you just kept going and eventually it just kind of happened? Um, well, to backed up real quick with the speed thing um i'd always been a little bit quicker than my size kind of dictated but i can remember the day that everything clicked and i i didn't know how to move like that you know i was i was taught how to move like that and you know some of it was speed but some of it was me just not telegraphing my moves you wouldn't be able to tell where i was going to move so when i did move it seemed quicker or it seemed shorter and it was because it was drained, it was, it was drilled into me over and over and over again how not to telegraph my movements. Um, as far as knowing when I wanted to be a black belt, I mean, 
I don't know. At, at the beginning, I was, you know, how long for this belt? How long do I have to be in for that belt? How long does it take me to get that belt to the next step, to the next step? And, um, you know, he'd tell me, and, and, and a lot of that, you know, we both know is, is depending on your personal experience and, you know, what goes on there. But, I mean, I knew the whole time. I knew that I would reach the age of, I'd reach the rank of black belt before 18, which would have made me a junior black belt. If I had continued on that path, um, we ended up moving away a little bit further away um, in between like high school and sports and stuff. I couldn't continue to go to class. So I ended up finishing it up after high school, but um, I, I had always wanted to go back and finish it. You know, it was, it was something that bothered me that I hadn't finished my block though. And um, when did you initially take your break? So like you, 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 at one point, you couldn't continue the training because because you moved away. What uh, what what belt did you have at that point where you had to take a break? Um, I actually just been promoted to brown belt. Um, we my mom wanted to move to another city for me to go to high school, and so we ended up getting into a pretty good school district. So I moved like 30 minutes away and didn't have a vehicle and my mom had to work. So I would have had to like take the bus after football practice and stuff. Um, but I had been a green belt for a good while. And um, I think it was during professors fifth degree black belt promotion. Um, I kind of got like a surprise promotion. I was like a little bit overdue. I wasn't worried about being overdue. I was having a good time, you know, still learning a ton. Um, and so I got kind of like a surprise brown belt promotion, but we were already planning on moving. And so I just, I felt so guilty, <laughs> you know? Um, but that's about where I stopped is literally right after I got my brown belt. Well, I know in jujitsu, they call it the blue belt curse, but I think in Kajukembo, we have a brown belt curse. We're like, <laughs> Oh, we totally do. <laughs> like, Everyone hits brown belt. And then it's like two years to get your black belt. And like people just don't stick around, man. It sucks, right? Because like at brown belt, you're essentially the skills and everything. You're like, you're there. You're, you're technically there. You just have to go through those last few, just those last few finishing touches to finish off the curriculum. Because the black belt and the teaching certificate are so close to each other. We don't just give black belts in Kaju Kembo. You have to earn it. And it kind of comes unsaid with a teaching certificate right around the corner. So they kind of want to make sure that not only can you do it, but you can teach it. And I think that's where people kind of mm -hmm. get stuck, like, in that last brown belt hazing period, which, like, again, it depends. I think that's where I think that's where it separates. Like I said, in, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's around blue belt that a lot of people quit. Because, like, at blue belt, it takes them two or three years to get – two years, two or three years to get it. And then at blue belt to get to purple, it takes a few more years. But essentially, once they get to purple, everything they know is very similar to what the black belts know. They just have to kind of stick around. And a lot of people in, in blue belt, they just kind of give up. And I've seen it happen a lot in, in brown belt. That's just like, <laughs> that's a rough, rough period for us. <laughs> so yeah. you got your brown belt. You had to go. But as you said, you, you finished up uh, high school. And then... You came back. Uh, do you want to? Do you want to? Do you have? What brought you back? How did that happen? Like, is there a story there? I mean, was, did you move closer, or what? What happened? It was kind of random. Um, <clears throat> I had moved back from living in the mountains. I like moved up to a mountain resort for a year when I was like eighteen or nineteen, and then I came back. And I was having trouble kind of finding a place to live, but I had a job. So I was kind of just living out of my car for the summer, hanging out with my friends, working a part-time job because housing in San Diego is so expensive. And I didn't have anyone I like was cool enough or wanted to room with really. So I just kind of stayed out of my car and my mom off offered to pay for my, uh, my classes to get my black belt. And I was like, well, why not? You know, the friends that I was hanging out with and kind of staying with off and on, uh, they lived in Escondido. So I was in the area a lot and uh, just kind of started going to class like that. And I, uh, I think around that time I was still pretty big. I, my weights fluctuated a bit in my life, but 
I remember I came back in uh, after like n- maybe not even a month, a couple weeks. Uh, Professor Ronnie was like, "You're testing for your black belt in six months," and I was like, "Wait, what? Like, I just came back. I didn't. Uh, no pressure. I didn't no really pressure. spend the time. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've been a brown belt for six years, but it's not like I put in the time training. I do basics sometimes, and I still could do shito on a competition level and stuff like that. But I definitely was out of practice. But like, you know, the muscle memory of the movements of like doing wushu and your forms and stuff like." when you locked in those movements on a level of perfection that we used to get to for, you know, competitions or even just to advance in rank, it's not something that you can easily just forget. You know what I mean? Um, so I was like, you know, you still got it. I just, I needed to refresh like all the different Palama sets and, you know, the last editions of some of the knife and, and club and punching grab techniques, you know, and, and just kind of, iron out the little the knowledge of the techniques so i think this brings us to a sub question this is something that i just had for my listeners if you want to check out the last episode with sifu john hojlo four shots of kaja kembo me and him have four shots of i have rum and he drinks tequila but we talk about forms and how or if forms are useful i don't want to give away what the answer was but i'm going to throw that question right over to you Cause you're a bigger guy and I've seen you spar. You, you know how to brawl, you throw down. That's not, you know, for, for those of you that don't believe me, uh, yeah, he throws down. <laughs> I, I encourage you to come out and maybe spar with him if you ever got a chance and you'll see. But, um, aside from that, how, what is your thought on forms? I, it's interesting. I actually had a conversation with a coworker the other day about this cause brought up that i'd be on the podcast and to me like at first you know forms do kind of seem a little bit dumb and a little pointless and i think one of the things i like about what our lineage in kajakembo has done with forms is i feel like they made them a bit more practical i don't want to like rag on any arts or anything but there's a lot of like you don't have very deep stances. You just, you're doing the same sequence of movements in different directions at different angles. And it just literally seems like just a sequence of movements. But like the way we were taught was this is a combat situation and you need to do this with all the intensity of which you would fight somebody. And, you know, kind of the way that I explained it to my coworker was, you know, you can work sparring combinations and I, you know, you can be taught how to, fight but linking all that together when you're in a situation isn't something that just anyone can do off the top of their head so when you have a sequence of movements that you can run through and you know how to work off of a block and you know how to work off of a a claw to the eyes or you know how to work off of a, a chop to the throat or a knee to the groin like you're not thinking what do i do next it's you have you know exactly what's coming next because you've done it so many times when you practice with that level of intensity it's just it's it's ingrained you get into a mode you know you've been there you know you settle into a place you've been that's how i look at it cool yeah yeah that's that's, um i think many people that appreciate forms for what they are would agree with you (laughs) so yeah going back to our to our story you now had six months to finish off the last bit at this point at this point how long i know you took a break how long were you practicing kaji kembo before your break i want to say like four years Okay, or so years. yeah about four years i'm All like right. age 10 to like age 14 like okay. right before high school all right and then you took your break and you came back as a grown man and now you have six months and this is just to give you an idea of like still you were practicing it wasn't like you yeah you took your break but you were still kind of working your line basics and i think a lot of people oh, dis- i even competed i competed after i had practiced in a couple of years um you know my mom used to work at the tournaments and do massage and stuff so at the san diego grand nationals i just 
I had automatic free entry in every event that I wanted every year. Oh, cool. Cause she knew the organizers or whatever. So for the next two years after I like stopped and I was in high school, like, you know, we'd go down there, she'd work, I'd watch you guys compete and stuff. And there was a couple times where they'd call my name one year. I think it was two or three years after I had stopped training. Really, they called me down for sparring and I was, I started scrambling. I'm like, let me borrow some gear. And I went down and like ended up taking first after not practicing for a while. And it felt good. But uh, yeah, so, there was like a six or seven year break in there. So, so there it is. Me kind of so, like. So you kept competing though. That, that's, I think that's, that's a really important thing to mention. Cause some people take breaks and they don't do shit. Like <laughs> they take a break yeah, and they, uh. You know, they, they'll just, uh, they'll stop, you know, life catches up. And I'm not talking, I'm not trying to talk shit about people that do that, but you didn't exactly do that. I mean, I'm, I'm in still, a bit of that. You, you still competed. Right now. Yeah. But, you, but even now, yeah. like, you were saying that you still practice like your line basics and you still try to do what you can. Now, going back to your break, so you took a break, four years, six months, now it's time for the black belt. And mm-hmm. or actually, I'm going to take a side tour real quick. Competition. How many times have you competed, do you think? Oh, man. I probably have to guess and say 50, 60 times. All right. And um, what were the divisions that you would compete in? Um, Age bracket and belt bracket. So... I think my first tournament was when I was a purple belt. All right. And I took first in forms, third in sparring. I was so disappointed. But um, that was, you know, I think 11 to 13-year-old bracket, purple, blue, green. And I competed in that bracket for a long time because I was like 11 and I was a purple belt. So through blue belt and green belt, 12 and 13, that was kind of my bracket for a long time. I didn't really compete much as a brown belt. Um, actual, except for those a few occasions, actually, after I quit. But for the most part, my competition years were purple, blue, green from the ages of 11 to like 13 or 14. Cool. cool. And you did, um, so you would do sparring and you'd also do, did you do continuous sparring too or just point sparring? I did continuous once or twice, but I did a lot more point sparring. Continuous wasn't available in a lot of the tournaments we went to. It was kind of far and few in between, you know. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't compete much because of that. I, I preferred continuous, so I'd, always and, just, I'd wait for those. <laughs> I, but again, a lot of competition behind you. By I, 50 or 60, I, right? I don't know. I had a problem getting DQ'd, even in point sparring, <laughs> just because being a bigger guy, when someone runs into you and your foot is out, they're gonna fly backwards. Even if I don't extend my leg and you run into my foot, you're going to move. And so, like, I don't know, in continuous, when you, you when you kind of continue going and going, like, it looks like I'm going hard, but I'm not. I'm just trying to move quickly, and people move out of my way when I <laughs> move quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing your job. You're doing your job right. <laughs> yeah, totally. And again, for my listeners. But uh, I also did a lot of weapons. Oh, cool, cool. What weapons did you do? Yeah. Uh, for the most part, staff was like my thing. Um, that, you know, winning and sparring was probably like, in my opinion, my biggest challenge being a like, you know, almost 200 pound 12 year old. You know, I was a chubby kid. Um, but forms and weapons were kind of like the easier wins for me just because of, you know, how much I got to train. Um, and how seriously I took like getting my stances right and displaying power. You're putting on a performance in a way. I kind of learned how to perform. And going back for to what you mentioned, is some people that don't do any martial arts. Um, a DQ is a disqualification. Happens to a lot of Kaju Kempo guys when we compete, especially for Chris's bracket as a kid. You know, when you have kids fighting. Uh, they want to keep the kids safe, so they do make rules where they don't allow full contact. So they, they're supposed to keep it light and controlled. They don't want kids getting head injuries. So to avoid this, um, they come up with a rule set that allows contact, but it has to be light. And you can't be coming in trying to KO 
uh, your opponent, but you are allowed to do a focus strike to the head. Um, but to, like Chris mentioned, as a bigger guy, uh, once he starts moving quick, uh, this this kind of gets into a real gray zone for him. But yeah, that's um, something well, little side note and, I want to mention. <laughs> and a lot of my DQs weren't for headshots; they were for body shots. <laughs> so like, yeah, well, because like you know you have in in the age there wasn't a weight limit or bracket, you know. So sometimes I'd have a kid that was only five foot two, five foot three, and I'm five seven, five six, and he's like 110 pounds or 100 pounds, and if they're running. You know, they're trying to charge in to get their point, and I raise my foot, and they run into it. Like, you know, first they get out of breath, so we have to, you know, respectfully turn around and let them catch their breaths, take a knee. And when it happens again, I'm just defending myself. I literally am just sticking my foot out. Um, And one time a kid, I mean, I don't know. You've sparred with me. You know that I don't really lose control of myself, and I'm not mm-hmm. trying to hurt anyone. I know how to spar at all levels, but one of these kids ended up throwing up after running into my foot and it was an automatic DQ. And I was like, I didn't even cock my leg. Like I didn't even <laughs> cock or extend my leg. I just put it up. <laughs> yeah. That's the name of the game, so, man. It's the name of the game. And it I'm is. In, like, and I'm in Japan, right? So like now I'm in Japan and I watch how Japan does it. They do it completely different out here, man. They don't have those rules. They, uh, they let the kids just go at it. And that, that is, <sighs> hard to watch i'll put it that way yeah it's, it's hard to watch two children go at it full contact as a, as a father like i wouldn't want my daughter doing that as a kid like yeah, yeah. so so I, I understand the rule set i understand both sides i think it's great uh to test yourself but at the same time i understand wanting to create a few boundaries but at the same time you know well, it, think- it's, it's happens it's part of the it's part of the risk we take and it's, it's the game we play so like <laughs> I mean, and I think there's a, a right way and a wrong way to do that. Um, if I remember correctly, when I met you, you were doing ninjutsu. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and you showed up with Ian and the guys to one of our Kaji Kimball fight nights. Um, and we were all mixing different arts together and people were calling each other out. And like, I think I was like 13 at the time and I called some adult out from another school. And, you know, my mom was like, you know, treat him like an adult. And like, in certain situations, you do that. And, like, even though that guy treated me like an adult because I was close to being built like one, neither of us lost control, hit each other directly in the face, but we had a really intense sparring session, you know? Um, and it was a great sparring session. I think you, could, you can have intense sparring sessions even with younger kids. I mean, 13 isn't all that young, but when you teach them how to control that power and how to control I, – I feel like – you know, learning how to make a focus strike on people um, kind of helps your technique, you know. So you could still get intense, but maybe not actually hurt someone. Like, make some contact, show them some love, but no injuries and knowing when to stop. Yeah, definitely knowing how to control your strikes. Um, there's a lot of great stuff that comes from that. Balance, especially. Because if you get used to always having the resistance of hitting a bag or hitting something full contact and then you miss and you you can that you can find yourself being way off balance so it is really good to be able to handle all sorts of intensities i think that's where that training really helps with mm-hmm. so you, now we're we took our side tour <laughs> and now we're gonna go back to our main story i do a lot of side tours if you don't notice um yeah, totally you were about to get you got ready to test for your black belt what was that like, man? What was your black belt test? What was required of you? What did you do to prepare? How did that work out for you? I mean, for me, a lot of it was kind of cramming information. You know, um, some of those older forms that we didn't really do as much. Um, I had to really ingrain into my memory, I think. Was it Plumber 1 through 6? So like one through three, I had pretty committed to memory. Four, five, and six. Four and five, you got to learn. Six is just open palmed. Five. Um, and then like some of the higher end club and knife um, techniques, I had to really commit to memory because they're not going to go, all right, do Paloma one, do number two, do knife one, do knife two. It's, you know, do knife eight, do club six. 
do Palama number three, you know, do Shito, do your sword set, do Palama number one, you know, and, and you have to like really, they they want to find out if you know all this. It's not, they're not going to give the opportunity to just memorize it in order kind of thing and rely off of that. So I spent a lot of time doing that um, and kind of just going through techniques over and over and over again. And I'd mix them up, you know, like, uh, Grab four and five are really similar. Um, you know, knife. Was it seven and nine? I think were the two that I threw back and forth. I th- uh, I think nine's the one you leapfrog, and then seven. I thought it was the growing strike or something like that, but I'd mix those two up because you go low on both of them. You know. Um. And so, you know, it was just repetition, repetition of all that. Um, I started teaching at a young age, so I didn't really, I didn't have to learn how to teach. I, you know, there was a time um, when Sifu Rani or Professor Rani overslept for class once. And I kind of just continued on, like, you know, nothing happened, like, because I had been helping him teach classes for a little bit. And I even had helped other people kind of prepare for their black belts before I even got mine. So. Um, for me, it was just, you know, repetition of, of retaining that knowledge so that I could do it on demand. Yeah. And I think, um, well, the, the cheat sheet that, that Sif, that Sifu, I, I, I say Sifu and he knows, he told me I can do this because I, I can't help myself. Okay, cool. I'm <laughs> yeah. Perf- yeah, I call him Sifu too. I have to try to call him Professor. Yeah, I, 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 around other people that don't know any better, I, I say Professor. And on the show, I, I always say it at least once so that people know. But then when I talk about him, okay. I, always talk about, I always mention the Sifu. And he, he understands that because that's just, you know. I was one of the few people that said, like, can I just kind of call you that outside of class? Because I love it. <laughs> He's like, if you oh, want. Oh, I used to call him that in public. <laughs> yeah, me too. I would never call him Ronnie. <laughs> no, that, that feels weird. It feels so weird yeah. calling him Ronnie. I can't do it. It Even does. Even to this day, I can't. And, but like, <laughs> Sifu is such a foreign word too. It's not American in any way. I feel so much more comfortable saying Sifu. Yeah. Than a normal American name, Ronnie. Nah, yeah, because you know? <laughs> he's he's more than just Ronnie to me. So he's like my second dad. So like that's why, like oh yeah, totally yeah. My dad died, so he's like pretty much my my dad. I see him as a father like figure. So yeah, Sifu is 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 what I, I used to. <laughs> I used to get him Father's Day gifts. He was the closest thing I had a dad to a dad to. Him. I never had a father figure really, so he was mine. Yeah, he's just. Yeah, that, that, I guess that, that also happens, right? That whole, I think that's something um, going more on our side tours that I love to go on. I think that's something that's really particular to Karju Kembo. Um, the fact that we're not, when I say we're not a McDojo, like there's a lot of McDojos out there. You pay your money, you go, oh, yeah, you do man. your martial art. And a McDojo doesn't always mean that they're not teaching you something valuable. There's sometimes True. great McDojos. Like uh, there's, I'm not going to mention like names. business. But yeah, there's more of business, right? Like, I've been to MMA it's clubs business. that it's a business. You go in, you pay your money. Yeah. They teach you how to fight. They teach you how to do some good stuff. But at the end of the day, when they clock out, it's done. Everyone goes home. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. One thing that seems to happen in Kaju Kembo a lot is this idea of Ohana or the, the spirit of family. This idea that yeah. once the class is over, yeah, the class is over, but then we all hang out and we go to barbecues together and we go to we go to the beach together. We do family outings and and all kinds of stuff. We just hang out and we just kind of grow this, uh, we develop these relationships that are a lot more than just going in and beating the crap out of each other. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, I don't know. My mom used to trade massage for, for lessons and we used to take those Vegas trips together. It's not like, well, let's all meet up for the competition hours. It's like, no, we all carpooled out there. We stopped in the ghost town together. We all fool around together, stop at the fireworks station together, you know, and all the adults would go out together and us kids would babysit each other in the room and make up dumb games to play. Like, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a whole family event, you know, it was, it was really cool. And, and people came in and out of that and like there was a core crew and it's kind of like ever evolving and revolving. But, um, I mean, that's, that's the closest thing I ever had 
to family besides just my mom and my brother, you know. Yeah. It was nice. Yeah, it's, that's definitely what I one of the things I really loved about it. So you practiced. You got ready to go. And, and just another side note, when you were saying about the clubs and the knives, my cheat sheet that Sifu gave me was that I can interchange club 1 through 5 for knife 6 through 10 and vice versa for clubs 6 through 10 and knives 1 through 5. And for those people watching, they're like, what the fuck did he just say? <laughs> that was the right. cheat sheet. That was the cheat sheet. That he said you might not necessarily land on the right numbers, but those are the techniques. And if you memorize it, that's fine. And I was like, all right, cool. Because <laughs> that was, that's a lot to cram for your test. But you go in there and you test. No, it's like over over 40 self-defense techniques. Yeah, yeah, that you have to perform. It's in, a lot. Yeah, and like you said, you have to perform on the fly. So you go in there. What? Where did they hold your black belt test? Um, it was at the gym, the, the Rancho Bernardo Rec Center or something like that. You were there? Yeah. No, I, I know. I always, well, when I, when I okay. ask these stories, I, um, I like to have my guest talk about it from a different perspective from what I saw, if that makes any sense. So yeah, my bad. So no, no, that's not, not your bad at all. <laughs> so for, yes, I was there for those <laughs> listeners. I was there for. For Chris's belt test, I was um I was one of the people that that was there for that tested him, but um you where was uh so he was at the gym, and what were your impressions of the test? How 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 were you feeling that day? Um, I mean, I was super nervous. I made the mistake of drinking a five hour energy beforehand. Oh no, that was stupid. It was really stupid. <laughs> Cause my mind was racing. Like I had the energy. I was, I, don't know, I was just nervous. I was like, it's such a long test. I'm going to run out of energy or something. And so I did that. And, um, you know, completely honestly, I wish I had gotten my black belt when I was a little younger. Um, cause the atmosphere within, um, Sifarani school was, oh, it was different. Not, worse or better it was just different um i think when you and i were like coming up when i was younger like there's a lot more intensity in things you know and we were a bit scrappier you know and um the the other guy that was testing with me he ended up getting injured pretty early on so that kind of put a hamper on things um especially like you know when him and i were sparring because it's like you're going through your black for your black belt i'm not gonna go easy on you like you know that's how we go but at the same time, the human part of me is just like, you know, guy messed up his hamstring or his knee. I forget what it was, but it was, it was some pretty good. bad Langett injury. Yeah, I think he messed up his knee. Um, okay. Yeah. And was... so, like, you know, I, I still kind of – I came at him, and we we had a good fight, but I wasn't, you know, I was trying to be considerate. Um, And, it, you know, he <laughs> – you don't reschedule a black belt test, you know, and props to Darren. Like he didn't stop. He didn't give up. He went through the whole process, man. And I couldn't imagine. I don't know if I would have gone through with it. If, if I had busted my knee as bad as he did, man, that looked bad. He was doing form self-defense, sparring yeah, all of us. Oh my God. Like, I, I was cringing watching him. He was limping, limping out. I remember, I remember him limping out because he got, yeah, he got, he got, I think he got injured. During the self defense, or during the warm up, I can't remember. I can't remember. I think it might have been a warm up or, or something early on. Maybe it was self defense, but yeah, I think it was. It was really early. I think it was during self defense, and we were again. Uh, some notes that should be mentioned: uh, the gym is a hardwood floor. I don't even think we pulled out mats. Did we pull out mats? Yeah, we did. Yeah. There were mats. Okay. At least we pulled out mats. That's good. <laughs> but that, there was still, it was in the middle of a gym. Yeah, but country camp with self-defense isn't a joke. No, it's not. Like, especially for the testings, we actually make contact. Um, yeah, we make contact. Pretty our, well, yeah. When, we, when we're doing the, the, the defense against a grab, a guy will really come out there and grab you. They're not just going to kind of like 
limply grab you. They're going to go in there and try to tackle you. You got to take care of yourself. And I think that's where he ended up hurting his knee. So you got your three year thing. You uh, finished the self defense portion. Got through the the forms. How was the sparring? You said you mentioned the first one on one wasn't what you wanted it to be because you the human side of you came out. You didn't want to. You felt bad, you know, abusing of someone who's already in there with an injury. But um, yeah, you, you got through your your one on one. How were the rest of the sparring matches for you? Well, Angelo, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if I fought you or Mike last. I think I fought Mike last. Yeah, Mike. But Mike. Requ- think, Mike, think Mike, Mike. Mike specifically requested you to for us to let him fight you last. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. So, uh, I mean, my match against you went pretty well in my favor, I'd say. Yeah, it did. Uh, I it had, did. I had you scampering, scampering around the ring a little bit. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, that went well. <laughs> but, like, I was, I don't know. I was hoping to have my ass whooped, man. And, like, don't get me wrong, that next fight, that's the closest I've ever been to being knocked out. And uh, Mike's a really, really intelligent fighter with a lot of technique. And it was my black belt promotion. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of get into our stances and kind of feeling each other out a little bit. And in order for me to hit Mike, there's a miracle of things that need to happen, you know, because he's so tall and he's so fast and he's so good that, like, I have to throw some kind of fake that allows me to have a follow up that both of those are going to end up getting blocked. I have to count on my first two strikes getting blocked while I close distance. And I have to try to score with the third one. And the odds of me doing that are just not in my favor, ever. Um, I think I've only hit him a few times in my life, kind of thing, like actually connected. And, you know, he kind of, he danced with me for a minute. And I was like, all right, this is how it's going to be. You know, you don't just sit there and dance with someone at your black belt promotion. You know, the, 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 the light, the ball's in my court. You know, the focus is on me, not on him. And so I just, I didn't quote unquote charge, but I just, I continually moved in on him and I just, I wouldn't stop. And I was catching kicks to the, to the chest, kicks to the head, you know, pretty good solid hooks. I had uh, kind of lost my balance once or twice. Um, and like, you know, we grew up doing the key eye checks and stuff and, um, you know, generally that's for the people that don't know, like you're in the class, we'll all get into like a squatting position horse stance and the instructor will come around and, you know, kind of give you a strike to the stomach and you have to exhale all your breath, ki, you make a noise and you tighten your abs. Like it all kind of happens together and it becomes such a thing when you're doing it and you're doing it in forms, you do it when you spar, like you'll hear us exhale when we throw punches and stuff because we're getting the air out of our lungs and our, and our diaphragm so that if you do get counterstruck, you won't get your wind knocked out. And so for years of doing that, you know, gradually graduating to being kicked in the stomach and stuff, um, you kind of build a tolerance to it. But I just, I kept walking up Mike and he just kept laying them into me, laying them into me. At the end, I was like, man, you made me kind of dazed there. You know, like I almost lost my footing. He's like, I'm surprised you just kept walking through all those darn kicks. Cause I just kept walking through him and he'd just throw front kick after front kick into me. I'm like, I'm not stopping buddy. <laughs> so, you know, that was, uh, I don't know. I, I like fighting Mike because I, I, I'd like to think that I'm a pretty good fighter, but I have nothing on that guy. And it's really humble. It's really nice to just have your ass beat. I think one thing I didn't, I never mentioned to you. And I think maybe it's because you, you're you're a real humble guy for being the size that you are you you still have a lot of respect equal respect for people no matter what size they are but going back to that let's just real quick how big were you how much what what were you weighing at when you walked into your black belt test oh i was like 320 pounds <laughs> oh my god <laughs> So yeah, let's let's put this into perspective for some people. So me and Chris had a one on one, 
And at the time, I believe right before I fought you, do you remember me and Mike were getting ready for an MMA tournament? I'm not sure. I think, I can't remember if that was right before or a little after that test. I think it was a little after that test that we did it, but we were getting ready for it. So I just recently cut weight from 190 to 175. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I'm I'm like five foot ten, <laughs> five ten, three twenty ish. And I'm like I was five yeah. nine, one seventy five. So like, coming into our one on one, like all the odds were in your favor. <laughs> the only thing I had for going for me was that I could maybe have better technique or maybe work the circle. And even then, you ended up getting me in a headlock and punching me in the back of the head. And I had I I had the lumps to prove it afterwards, but um, <laughs> I talked to uh, when we were talking to Sifu Mike. Sifu Mike said that he's never actively tried to knock anyone out during a black belt test, and even Sifu until Mike, that day, until that day, he's never actively tried. Oh, wow. He's knocked people out. Yeah. He's knocked me and everyone else out, but all that was never with the mentality of I'm going to try to knock. Angelo out, or I'm going to try to knock uh, Bob out, yeah. or whatever. He never thought to himself that. He always walk in saying, "I'm going to try to yeah. use the cleanest technique and the best technique to to give this person a hard time." But he never said, "I'm going to try to knock him out." Even when I asked Mike one time, "Try to knock me out," even then he held back. Like he got to the point, I I, I was sick, and he popped me during my test. It was a green belt test or something, and um. When he popped me, I was sick. All my sinuses came out, and he could have knocked me out. But again, he he, he stepped back because he's again he's never actively tried to knock anyone out except for you, and you survived it. Um, Good and ag- and again, like he's we're talking about if we're looking at MMA standards here, Mike went down because he was also getting ready for a fight coming up. He went down to about two twenty. 215 so we're talking about light heavyweight category if we if we were talking about weight classes mike would technically be a light heavy i'd be a welterweight and you'd be in the heavyweight category if we're talking about weight classes um which we're not yep but again i think uh going back to when i started this uh this interview talking about how as a big guy you still moved around very very clean uh, your technique is really hard to predict. And when you do move, you can move quickly. You're not like supersonic, but you do move quickly. And you have a lot. You know how to throw your weight around to your advantage. Because I remember I tried to fool. Mm-hmm. I tried to do a sidekick on you. And I just bounced off you. Like. <laughs> it, was, it, was right. like it was like kicking yeah. a giant. But like. It was and like kicking put- a giant rubber ball. I kicked, I kicked you as hard as I could. But I ended up flying back. Because you came in, yeah. you had the timing where you kind of came in and you and you popped your belly out while breathing out properly to purposely do that. Like it was not like you mistakenly did it. You knew I was getting ready to do it, and um and you purposely used your weight to get me off balance. So like, there's a whole style to the way, and I think that's the cool thing about Kaji Kembo. There's a whole style you can develop that's very catered to your strengths and weaknesses, and I think that is what you demonstrated in your black belt test, which is really good. In my opinion. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. So you got your black belt and um, everything wrapped up from there. How did you uh, – what did you do after that? What did you want to do after that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm nearing 30 now, and I've kind of been on a path of self-discovery for the past decade. So, um, I had already planned on going back to the mountains when I came back to San Diego. Um, and so like learning that I was going to be tested for my black belt, I was like, Oh wow, like, you know, this is wild. Um, I didn't expect that, but I completed that. And, uh, right after that, I moved to Colorado, um, to live on another ski resort and do that. And then I came back and started going to school and, I think it was near the end of uh, my schooling. I started going back to see for running's class. I started teaching on the side too a little bit, 
I had like some friends and random people that were interested. So I did like, you know, the lessons in the park, like all great martial artists start out teaching at a park. Um, and you know, that was, that was about fun and spreading knowledge not about money. And, um, near the end of my schooling and stuff and my stay in San Diego, I spent a lot of time teaching at Sifa Ronnie's and I really enjoyed that. Um, and at that point, you know, throughout the process of me going to school and stuff, I, I got back into shape and I had lost like a hundred pounds at that point. And so, man, could I move then Angelo, <laughs> if you had been around and I, I didn't get a chance to come across Mike then, but I had wanted to spar Mike for a while once I'd lost weight. Cause uh, it was just so much easier for me to put my foot exactly where I wanted it or, you know, not telegraph or, <clears throat> you know, I have one of the things, like you said, you can't really tell where I'm going. I have really good footwork and footwork kind of marks a lot of fighters because, you know, you could use it to either trip a fighter up. You could use it to lead a fighter the wrong direction. Um, you could use it to convey different types of messages, um, even subconsciously. And uh, my footwork just got so much better. And it was just, yeah, I just had a great time. Um, and then, yeah, I probably did that for like a year. And then once I finished school up, just uh, random circumstances of life, I ended up moving to Denver and I've been here ever since. I had a couple people interested in learning and I've done like some self-defense sessions with people or I teach them some self-defense, but I haven't, uh, I haven't really, really been teaching. My roommate's kids, they're kind of interested and learning, and I don't know, one of my things is I want to be able to teach someone from A to Z. You know, I don't want to give them a taste and move away. Uh, I mean, if I give them a taste and they want to pursue it and they can find someone else to learn from, you know, that's awesome. But I feel like there's a commitment that you have to have to your students, you know, and that's why I haven't really chosen to teach is because I haven't been able to give that commitment back to them. Because in a way, you know, it's it's like a contract. And like the student is committing to something. And I think the instructor needs to be on the, the other side of that, you know, willing to do the exact same. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair, man. That's good that you have the judgment to evaluate that. I think some people don't. And that becomes a problem where they try to juggle the idea of teaching while and they, they, they can't handle it. And they kind of do like a a half-assed program and they have to abandon their students later. And that's, I think that's worse than just being able to I mean, honestly be saying like what you can do, you know? I think that that's kind of a philosophy of life that people have kind of lost track of. Like, I'd love to have a dog, man. I really want a dog, but I don't have a house, you know? And <clears throat> sometimes I don't have a, the time to give a dog the attention that it deserves or that I think that deserves, you know? <clears throat> and so, you know, I hope to get to a place where I can own a dog soon. Um, but I feel like the same thing can be said about, I mean, not so much possessions, but possessions, uh, kids. Some people don't take parenting very seriously. And I think people need to really think about the commitments that they make to their pets, their friends, their family that they bring into this world um, and not take on things that you're not capable of fulfilling you know yeah social contracts yeah yeah that, that actually answers a question i was going to ask you what what did your journey in martial arts teach you outside of martial arts but i think that answered it beautifully <laughs> that's a really good way to oh i mean that's to connect those that's two one like, of many uh, things <laughs> totally i mean i was never really hot-headed um but just learning how to be humble and knowing that there's someone always better. And I mean, I think you and I know because we're fighters, but I think a lot of people in rougher neighborhoods too know that when you go to pick, you want to, when you go to start some shit with someone and they aren't responding to it and they're really calm about the situation. A lot of times people don't, the people that know, know not to fight that person, the calm guy. Cause those people, they know what's coming. They know how to handle it. And they're not in the slightest bit intimidated by you. 
And so like, you know, I gained, I gained that sense and it, it's helped me in a lot of situations. Um, I've learned to navigate really hostile situations. Um, I've, I avoided being stabbed once at a concert over some stuff like this, being able to nonchalantly brush off three guys trying to corner me. You know what I mean? It's like, people don't do that. Especially when the three guys were bigger than me. You know what I mean? Like these guys were all over six foot and we're in the 200 some odd plus pound range, you know, and I was definitely not comfortable, but I had faith in what I had learned and I had learned to keep a cool head. And I, I found my exit from that area and I moved swiftly and everything ended up okay. I didn't even need to use any technique. I never touched any of them, you know, but like I learned situational awareness. I learned respect for other people. You never know what other people are capable of or what they've been through and stuff or why they're acting the way they are. Like, you know, even though the bullying stopped pretty quick after I stopped doing martial arts, you know, but that happened only because I defended myself a few times and it was clear that none of those kids were able to kind of match my level, but I didn't have to like take it too far, you know? And, and even after that, like, it's not like I hated them. Anyways, what I was getting to is it's like a last line of defense. You're taught that and you're taught how to defuse situations. Like that's something we practice is how to defuse situations, how to remove yourself from the situation. Um, and that has served me just as well, if not better than actually having to protect myself. In addition to a myriad of other things that I learned, you know, mind, body, body, spirit connection. And oh, I, could, I could keep going on about the things I learned on the C for running. Yeah. And that, I think that's, those are all great things to mention because I feel that that's something that Kaju Kembo brings to the table that some places or many other places don't. And I would say that if you're looking for a place to train at, it doesn't matter what style it is. I hope you can find a place that's like that. I hope you, I hope, I hope you can find a place that can facilitate all the things that Chris just mentioned. So before we wrap up, Chris, what's your advice? What's your advice for someone who wants to study martial arts, doesn't really know where to get started? What's your advice for this kind of a person? Hmm. Um, you know, I think you should find something that you connect with that serves your purpose. Um, not everyone needs the training that I needed for the reasons that I needed it. Some people need to train martial arts for different reasons, whether it's philosophical, whether it's health, where it's making that mind body, you know, connection, um, whatever jives with you, I think is good when it comes to, if you want to learn how to fight and, you know, really defend yourself, I recommend doing some research, um, into different arts and what they're used for. When I have to explain to come to the people, it's, it's almost a foreign concept. Yeah, it's a, it's really um, if we want to, if we want to tangent just for a second, because like, it is a street style self-defense art and it is purely that there's a traditional sense to it but the end game and everything that you're learning is to defend yourself in the street so and, and so yeah i've talked to other martial arts you know jiu-jitsu guys or this or that who like you know some people are a little hot-headed with their martial art and they're like oh you know what would you do if you were sparring me you know, I'm like, well, I'd kick your knees out and I'd probably chop you in the throat. And if I had to, I'd knee you in the balls and then I'd kick you in the face while you're on the ground. You're like, well, that's not a fair fight. I was like, well, we're not in a ring. <laughs> oh, there's, you, you know, asked, there's no such you, thing as a fair fight. They asked what you would do. I, you know? <laughs> yeah. You're like, what would you do to me on the street? That's exactly what I'd do. You know, I was taught to win. And if you bring me to the point that I have to defend myself, I'm going to win. Um, unless there's a referee and you want to put on some gloves to have fun and establish some rules, there are no rules. That is just the way of the streets. You know, you're not going to get into a fight with someone in the club and I feel like, Hey man, well, we decided we were going to have a fist fight here and you're pulling out a knife. So depending on what you need, you know, you need to go and do the research and find what you need. If you want something to stay physical or to learn different aspects of yourself go ahead and do that but 
you know, I know there's some really harder style martial arts like uh, Wing Chun, Kajikembo, you know, uh, I don't know, there's, there's tons of them out there, but different ones facilitate different needs. And I'd just say do some research into what you think is going to fit you and then find an instructor that's as passionate as you are. You know, I think that that's a really big thing. You know, there's a lot of people in the world, no matter what they do, that punch a clock. Um, and you need to find someone who has a level of passion that you can kind of be ignited by or, you know, work with in order to, because you're going to learn so much better in an environment like that. That's just a fact. So I think, you know, that'd be my advice. That's some good advice. You heard it here, folks. Well, Chris, that wraps up. Is there any final last J Jerry Springer? Any final thoughts? Like, is there anything else that you wanted to mention before you go, or, um, or is that are you you good? Um, you know, in the spirit of Jerry Springer, take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I think that practicing martial arts is is really great for more than just learning how to fight. Um, I think that a lot of people put a lot more hype around that, especially with what UFC has done. I mean, at one point I was like, oh, I should try that out. But, you know, the philosophy that you get from it and the, the discipline that you get from it, family you could find from it, like some of those things are more valuable than just learning how to throw a punch. You know, so I'd say explore it, even if you're not completely sold on it or interested in it. Um, and see if there's something about that that kind of identifies with you. That's what I'd say. My final thoughts. Well, brother, I really appreciate you being on the show. And then for my listeners, stay tuned for the wrap-up. And that's a wrap. Thanks for checking out Social Dilla with Angelo. Subscribe to my YouTube. And I'll catch you all later. Peace.